The key to an understanding of the nature of the conscious life of the soul lies in the sphere of the unconscious. All the difficulties, even the apparent impossibility of a real understanding of the secrets of the psyche become obvious in this light. If it were absolutely impossible to be aware of the unconscious in consciousness, man would have to despair of ever understanding his psyche. If, however, this impossibility is only apparent, then the first task of a science of the psyche is to explain how man's mind can descend into these depths. Before this attempt, let us consider to what extent the unconscious life of the soul actually forms the true basis of conscious life. At first glance, into our inner life, we see that the greatest part of our psychic life rests in the realm of the unconscious. What we are consciously aware of, only a few ideas at a given moment, we create continuously thousands of ideas that are completely unconscious, unknown at the moment, and yet definitely existent. This is an indication that the greatest part of psychic life lies in the night of the unconscious. Later, when we trace the remarkable evolution of an idea, we shall see that the life of the psyche may be compared to a great, continuously circling river that is illuminated only in one small area by a light of the sun. The mere fact that the greater part of our conscious thought continually sinks into the unconscious and can only re-enter consciousness occasionally and in fragments already characterizes the unconscious life of the psyche as the basis of conscious life. The relationship, however, is a much deeper one. The entire life of the psyche, the whole realm of our innermost spiritual being, clearly distinguished by our consciousness from the external world, rests upon and arises from the unconscious. We need but glance at the development of the mind to realize that it is based completely on images and thoughts no longer existent in consciousness, but on those which sank into the unconscious long ago. As small children, we learn to use certain ideas and their conclusions that were essential at the time for mental development. Later they disappeared entirely and were completely lost. We had to lose them because they were no longer needed. Something new developed from them. What was formerly conscious has thus become unconscious. But this unconscious is the basis of our present consciousness. All the foregoing suggests very forcibly that we should not approach the mysteries of the psyche without having first gained a definite insight into how it slowly comes into being. Three periods must be distinguished in the life of an individual. One, a mere microscopic original cell, a miniature egg consisting of concentric integuments. Two, something growing within the egg, an embryo. 3. A true human being. The first period is the latent existence of the ovum. The ovum lies in the most secluded depths of the healthy maternal organism from birth, quite inseparable from the mother's life, without any perceptible change, unique in itself for two or three decades, and of course without the slightest trace of a higher psychic life. Then. Awakened by the living interaction between the male soul and the maternal soul, the second period in the life of the growing child begins within the mother's womb. The originally simple form now separates into opposites according to the remarkable inner laws of its own unconscious being. From this beginning, the immense variety of human form takes shape and grows. The form, however, is still quite, even decisively, different from that of the mature man. Growing within the egg, the embryo, surrounded by integuments with all the organs that will later determine its relations with the world, is still facing inward. That is how it appears at this stage of life. Here again there is nothing to suggest any dawning of consciousness. Nothing in our mature psyche therefore exists that could be called a memory of that life, a reminiscence of our second period of life. The being itself, the entire effect of the divine spark, the it, inner primordial image, is revealed at this unconscious stage only as a mysteriously creating power. 
and its unconsciousness that shows itself as continually and wisely developing according to miraculous laws, a life that can, when more clearly understood, prepare us all the better to understand the miracle of the higher manifestations of the psyche. As an essential complement to this study, I have devoted a second work, Physis, to the understanding of this developmental process. The third and truly human period of life starts with birth. Just as the spacious outside world begins to affect the organism in various ways, and is in turn affected by it, a faint distinction between itself and other beings begins slowly to dawn in the dark, unconscious regions of the soul. From then on, despite periodic returns to the unconscious, the particular world of the self-conscious, feeling, willing, and discriminating soul develops with advancing maturity, out of that early unconscious state. Broadly stated, this is the essence of our development as man, as soul. By strictly adhering to this knowledge and by guarding against arbitrarily adding anything, by faithful and persevering introspection, and by intelligently managing to reconstruct our being from the conscious state backward into the unconscious, only then may we hope to find what I have called the key to an understanding of the conscious life of the soul, i.e. the understanding of the conscious through the unconscious. This is difficult, but not impossible. In the present inquiry, we will proceed with the spiritual, just as we do with the organic when we study a developmental process we, excel, we ourselves experience, but understand only by observing it to take place in others. Ancient investigators from Aristotle on followed this path much more faithfully than more recent writers, though they knew next to nothing about the organic states of human consciousness, differentiation and development. In their view, the soul appeared in the first stage of development as the forming, shaping and nourishing essence of everything alive. Conscious perception developed only at a later stage. Aristotle puts it very beautifully in De Anima. The soul is the primary act of a physical body capable of life. Error and discord arose in those theories only when the soul was severed from life and attempts were made to introduce the most abstruse concepts about life. When we learn that Friedrich Hoffmann's physiological theory, which stated that plants were lifeless because they have no heart, could find supporters at the end of the 17th century, we can see why there was controversy over whether animals have souls, or at what time the soul enters the child from outside. A deus ex machina, the so-called life force, was produced that, owing to its absolute power, was responsible for the development of the organism. The soul had to be considered a stranger, introduced into this shell at a later stage. This theoretical development was in part the product of a theological dispute, for it appeared to a certain unenlightened spirits who supported this latter theory that it was sacrilegious to assert that the same thing that feels and thinks in us is also responsible for our development and sustenance. To them this seemed to open the door for denial of the immortality of the soul. Consequently, something other than the soul had to be active in the development of our body organs. This line of thought allowed the question to arise whether animals, or at least the more primitive animals, have a soul. Plants were considered soulless since they were barely credited with life. This whole intellectual development is very surprising. Earlier, the strictest theologians, e.g. Thomas Aquinas, did not hesitate to allot both the last stage, perception, and on another level, the first stage, sustenance and shaping, to the soul. They did not feel this denied the doctrine of immortality, for they sensed that death would only alter the soul's function, that only its role in regulating organic development could cease. One aspect of the soul would merely come to an end, but the basic entity would continue. This intellectual development was only part of the reason why the soul was not seen to be the first reality of a natural, systematically arranged body. The other part of the reason is that a barrier stood between the unconscious and consciousness, shutting out everything not conscious from the realm of the soul. Because we consciously come into being, grow, nourish and shape ourselves, 
but are conscious only of our sensory impressions, our perception and our will, only these functions were said to belong to the soul proper. Everything else remained in the dark where a special mysterious power, the quote-unquote life force, reigned. Consciousness, clear thinking, or at least the capacity to form definite sensory images to influence action with a soul's credentials. Anything else was not recognised as soul. A special life force was instituted for the shaping and nurturing functions of the organism and another special soul for feeling, perception and will. What was gained by this deception? The result was two different souls, or two essentially different primary powers in an organism which proved to be one in origin life tendency and self-consciousness. Life force, or formative instinct, or whatever name it bears, must always, and in all its forms, be self-moving, not moved by outside factors. Therefore it must share in the divine, since the divine is always and essentially unmoved, moving itself and others from within itself. The same thing, however, has to be said of the soul itself. Thus, any attempt to find characteristics that would establish lasting and incontestable differences between the life force and the soul ends in a vicious circle. The life force, however it may be managed, will always remain self-moving, something individual, driven only by the breath of the divine, in a word, a kind of soul. All attempts to separate the soul from the palpable organism and distinguish it from organic life will fail. We will always consciously see the soul as being most closely linked to all the forms of our life. Some physiologists have quite naturally concluded that the soul is merely an intensified life force in its most powerful manifestation. There can be no objection to this as long as we agree that there is no life force apart from the creation of life through the divine idea. For most conclusive proof, and a demonstration of the oneness rather than the duality of the essence on which our whole being is based, consider the following. Unawareness of the cause that forms and nurtures life does not prove the difference between it and the soul. For although much that goes on in the organism never becomes conscious, everything that happens there, at least has an indirect effect on consciousness. The entirely unconscious functions responsible for the growth and form of the organism as an embryo are connected to consciousness in that they create organs that later receive, retain and modify images. Other functions that are only partially unconscious, such as blood circulation, growth, excretion, etc., have still more influence on consciousness. In illness, some of them intrude directly on consciousness. There is no firm barrier between the soul and the so-called life force. Furthermore, if the soul and the life force were truly and essentially different, no sense organ could affect the mind, nor could the mind itself affect the body. Thus, everything suggests that a unified life principle, something self-moving, Aristotle's entelechy, Plato's idea, or a psyche, a soul, something divine, call it whatever you will, is the basic condition of all life, and therefore of all living forms. Words denoting the secret principle of all life usually are the same as those for breath, anima, spiritus, noima. The notion behind this pictorial term is that breathing is one of the most perpetual and uninterrupted manifestations of life. I believe, however, the word breath has another denotation. The breath of the divine that creates the body is implied far more than the breath of the body. The striking words of Genesis, And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, obviously mean just that, just as inspiring and being inspired can only refer to that. Happily, this brings the following thought to mind. Only those living creatures who in turn send forth that divine breath to make resound, 
per sonare, as the voice of the antique actor through his mask, gives us the concept of an individual, of a self-governing person who guides his life according to a superior knowledge. We should thus recognise something divine in every living creature. It forms the very essence of life. We must perceive it as the basis of the creature's reality. This is what we call the idea of its being, or the soul. Soul. In our thoughts we can separate many things that are never separated in reality. We can differentiate in every creature, as Aristotle says. One element, matter, which of itself is of no particular thing. Another, the form, or species, according to which it is called this particular thing. And a third, that which is from both of these. The material element is potentiality, and the formal element is actuality. From D. Anima. In a living creature, a creature that is self-developed, self-sustained, self-nurtured and self-moving, it is primarily the divine spark that determines the form. We have recognised the spark as the original basis of the individual being. The form, called by Aristotle the actuality of the object, is generally constant and evenly sustained throughout life by the divine spark. Matter, called potentiality, by Aristotle continually changes, is lost and has to be replaced. In my system, the divine, which contains the primary basis of individual life, is called the idea or the primordial image. Potentiality, which reflects or manifests this idea, is called matter or ether. And finally, I designate actuality by the word form, whereby the spiritual and bodily reality lives. These are the three components of a living being. It must be kept in mind that these divisions are arbitrary. We can never separate them objectively. Form without matter, and without an idea to govern it, is impossible. Matter without form is again an impossibility, and an idea, a primordial image, which is not active in any form, not reflected anywhere, cannot exist. The ability to imagine these operational distinctions is the highest development of the self-aware idea. Nevertheless, this kind of thinking is very dangerous. We could easily grant these notions some reality. The result would be an abstruse and most unsatisfactory concept of the world and man. We now have a truly human point of view that alone is enlightened and enlightens all activity in science and life. That there is a divine component, something self-moving and self-developing, is borne out both by our own deeper inner spirit and by our observations of the world and of all living things. Just as certainly do our reflections and observations tell us of the existence of the material component that conditions our inner and outer life in a thousand different forms. Moreover, we can perceive and name those eternally unified primordial aspects of the highest divine being and separate them in our minds for the clearer development of our thinking. This much is open to us in the true realm of metaphysics. But since we can never know them directly, any attempt to define and explain the highest internal relations of the essence of the divine, of the absolute God, manifesting itself in the world, will somehow lose its way in shimmering, foggy and sterile regions. In the present study, we shall attempt to establish the following point of view, that the divine component in our deepest being unfolds itself from the unconscious to consciousness. Once again we wish to assert that the key to an understanding of the nature of the conscious life of the soul lies in the sphere of the unconscious.